The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is so good to have you worshiping with us, participating. Uh, your presence makes our worship complete. So thank you. I do want to mention that worship happens during this Lenten season for First Presbyterian, not only on Sunday mornings, but every Wednesday in Lent, um, our youth of the church are hosting, are producing, are sharing a worship experience with you. So you can find that on our website, you can find it on our uh, YouTube uh, posting as well. So uh, please join us for those Wednesday events. In connection with that, I do want to mention that we are planning some special Holy Week services leading up to Easter. And um, I'll just say at this point, stay tuned. Those will be, information will be coming as we get a little closer. I do want to mention the fellowship opportunity this Sunday afternoon today um, at uh, between 2 and 3. Mark Gooch is once again hosting a fellowship time uh, for all who wish to join in on that Zoom call. At this time, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. For this third Sunday of Lent, we have three American composers who all have ties to Ohio. First of all, Paul Mons, who was well known in Lutheran circles. He served Lutheran churches in Chicago and Minneapolis for decades, and also served as a composer, arranger, and teacher throughout that time. He taught at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. Uh, one of his most famous choral pieces, In So, Lord Jesus, Quickly Come, is so well respected that it has made several appearances uh, at Oxford for the Christmas Eve service. Secondly, John Ferguson, who was born in 1941. John is retired from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, where he served for many years as music professor and uh, Bow Chapel organist as well. He's well known now for his hymn arrangements in particular, both for choir and for congregation. The choral scholars are singing a setting of Martin Luther's Out of the Depths I Cry to Thee, which is Luther's own paraphrase of Psalm 130 that he composed in 1523. The point of the text as Luther interprets it is that the grace of God is far greater than the weight of our sins. Our last composer is Wilbur Held, who I've mentioned before. He died in 2015 at age 100. He was for many years professor of organ at Ohio State University and served Trinity Episcopal Church on the square in uh, Columbus. The hymn, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love, was composed by a Catholic priest in, on the south side of Chicago in the 1960s. And the text is inspired by John 13, 35. By this shall all know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. When our hearts are troubled, let us draw near to the one who shelters us with love. When others disappoint and leave us, let us turn to the one who takes up the cause of those who suffer and defends the powerless in hope, in longing, in trust, in community, let us worship in the presence of God. Let us pray. <clears throat> From your hands, O oh God, comes our good and the good of all creation. From our hands, O oh God, receive our joyful thanks and trust. For within our remembrance and our hope, you give us cause to celebrate and the means to share your love and grace with all. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession and then pray silently. In the words of scripture and the rituals of community, we know your desire for us, nurturing God. You yearn for us to make a home in the shelter of your love, but we often resist and push you away. We find belonging in soulless places and merely exist in the chaos of our scattered lives. When we become aware of our deepest selves again, we come to know our own longings. For he embedded in the wings of your love you birthed us from the heart of your imagination as we draw near to you. Sustain us with your constant presence. Enable us to know ourselves completely in the shadow of your love. Here each worshiper may offer personal silent prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. In every wilderness, on every road, in every moment, in every life, God is with us, bearing the gifts of forgiveness, courage, and unending love. So let us, with renewed hope, celebrate the richness and diversity of life in God's presence. Amen. Please turn to those around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. The scripture reading for March 7th is Matthew 19 verses 16 through 26. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, also you shall keep, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all of these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it would be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, Then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Something amazing happens when we hold our stuff a little looser and give riches away. 
when we give to our neighbor, when we choose to love our neighbor more than our wealth, we become the people God created for us. We become whole. Jesus knew this would be very difficult for us, but Jesus also said all things are possible with God. Anaya, can you tell us some ways we can help people that are in need? Some ways that you can help people are donating clothes that you don't that you don't fit into, or just baking them cookies, or maybe send them a little fortune cookie or a little note that says, I love you. And you can give them hugs, you can cook cook for them, you can invite them over for dinner. Anything that you think is kind and caring and responsible, you should look forward to doing that. Those are awesome ways, Anaya. Can you do the prayer for us? Yes, I can. Dear God, you include us and embrace us even when we don't do not feel perfect or whole. There is nothing we can't do to cancel your love for us. Inspire us to make wise choices, have generous hearts, and seek visible, invisible, invisible tre treasure. treasure. Amen. Amen. Please join me in this moment of prayer. God of Lenten beginnings, again and again, you show us just how mysterious you are, how wonderfully complex, expansive, and deep your love is. But even in that mystery, we know and feel your presence through invitations to remember our roots and delight in our creaturehood even in this season of wilderness. And yet, we often build up exclusionary tables, ones that oppressions dine on. Sexism, racism, phobias and fears that destroy and divide us. We fail to remember that the church isn't a place for just the insiders and we are guilty of ignoring or outright missing the point that the message of your love compels us to take seats at a different kind of table, the table of fellowship and radical hospitality where all are invited to dine. God of justice and inclusion, rupture any ice and stone that remains around our hearts today. Forgive us of our complacency and free us from judgments that bind us from acting. Guide us in your ways to flip over any table, habit, belief, or point of view that perpetuates injustice or exclusion. God of gentle peace, Walk with us as we navigate painful anniversaries, trauma, and hurts that might cause us to hurt others. For even in our efforts to love and do justice, we are still human, and this year has still been very hard. As we worship and pray and move closer and closer to the threshold of Holy Week. Breathe your spirit of courage, kindness, and solidarity on each of us, wherever we need to feel it the most. Be near us in our celebrations and our mourning, in the quiet moments before, before dawn and dusk, and in the eyes of our neighbors and we will meet you in the garden and at the tomb and on the outstretched road ahead, walking with us every step in every place. 
With hopeful and aching hearts, we pray all of this. Amen. Before I read the biblical text for today, I want to say that in my experience, I have found the use of the word Satan or satanic to describe another person very disturbing. I spent my adolescence in a literalist, fundamentalist, judgmentalist foreign mission school that taught a reality that included a visceral actual concept of the devil, Satan. Back then, I had read C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, which articulates the fictional, but for me back then, realistic conversations between a head devil and his or its devil protege. The text we are about to hear includes the naming of a person as Satan. With the years I have lived, the experiences I have had, and the theological education and study in which I have engaged, I consider the words and concept of devil or Satan to be completely literary or metaphorical a linguistic attempt to capture the concept of evil we see portrayed by human beings and events historically and in our own time. It would be convenient 
to ascribe the worst of human behavior as the work of the devil. But I, sadly, name it as a destructive byproduct of our innate humanity, a humanity that must always fight against its fear of the other and continually work to embrace the biblical Jesus teachings of primary care for the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the least of these, the enemy, those ever on the margins of life. So, with all of that said, let us hear this gospel passage from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 37. Then Jesus began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Jesus said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Now, just ahead of the passage we have just heard, Peter had answered Jesus' question of who the disciples think he is. And Peter said, you are the Messiah. Then here, three sentences later, Jesus was calling him Satan. In the gospel story, Peter has come in for more than his fair share of failings, sinking into the Sea of Galilee from lack of faith, suggesting booth building in the transfiguration scene, hearing the cock crow three times after denying his Lord. And now, the one who had become known as Peter the Rock has become a stumbling block. What a hard fall from the top of the heap. It is a wonder Peter recovered at all, let alone became the pillar of the early church. But as Barbara Brown Taylor has remarked, that is the way it is in the kingdom of God. One minute you may be walking on water, and the next gasping as a wave washes over. Sometimes faith seems strong as a rock, and then it dissolves into fear and uncertainty. You fail miserably at the tasks you are given, and along comes the master to give you some more and to say, get up and follow me. It seems, Taylor says, we cannot be too inadequate or misguided or even faithless for the kingdom of God. We just need to be reminded to set our minds on divine things. But it is some of the human things that I wonder about in this scene this morning. This must be the loneliest time in Jesus' ministry. He had already been rejected by the religious leaders, by the clergy of his day, Sadducees, Pharisees, chief priests, scribes, elders. And now, as he set his face toward Jerusalem, 
and the danger and death lurking there, his most trusted inner circle began to question his mission. They knew what Jerusalem means. The orthodox religious leadership there <clears throat> demands conformity. The Roman civil government demands strict obedience. And any deviation from either is brutally punished. And so the fearful voices whisper, this must never happen to you. Those tempting voices, they never left Jesus. In the wilderness before his ministry began, the story says the devil tempted him along with the wild beasts. But this new temptation from within his closest followers was the most insidious and difficult of all. A reasonable, concerned, persuasive call to take the way of least resistance, to avoid the controversial confrontation, to live a life of quiet normalcy according to the rules of the world around him. However differently and less violently we would like the story of Jesus to be told, the disturbing reality is that he took God's message of radical love and liberation and reconciliation right into the teeth of the religious and political establishment that would not be transformed. Instead, they crushed him and thought that was the end of it. This is the harsh preview of things to come that Jesus gave his disciples in this scene from Mark. And then he makes the unexpected invitation, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up a radically countercultural disengagement from, rely from reliance on the power, prestige, and presumptions of life in these times. This invitation, this radical call of faith, is no less shocking for us than it was for Peter and the disciples. We are comfortable. Our lives are normal and innocuous. We have it so good, life seems so secure. Surely that is how it should be for anyone who would follow Jesus. And yet the pandemic, racial and electoral events of this past year locally and globally remind us that security is fleeting. The hope of tomorrow is just that, a hope, a hope that we are powerless to secure. In trying to hold on to life, we simply watch it slip away. As human beings, our preoccupation in life is trying to guarantee the future for ourselves, our family, our church, our nation. But when we engage in this ageless futility, we end up dying slowly by degrees. Jesus makes a radically different claim to his disciples and to us. Lose your life for my sake and you will find it. Orient your life towards God and the needs of others. Lose your preoccupation with yourself. Find your life in caring for others, in working for their greatest good. This is God's invitation to us as individuals and as a community of faith. And the consequences of 
accepting this invitation changes our lives, our communities, our national aspirations, even our world. Jesus dares to claim that in losing ourselves, in giving ourselves away, we find our true selves. We find life. This life, this new understanding of discipleship, is learned along the way. Integrity of faith is something that we live into, something we practice over a lifetime with all the dips and turns and failings of our human natures. This losing ourselves to find life is a journey together that we, that began before we ever joined it and will continue after we are gone. We follow the one who has called us to live to receive the lives we thought we lost. As the eloquent preacher Barbara Brown Taylor puts it, to follow Jesus means going beyond beyond the limits of our own comfort and safety. It means receiving our lives as gifts instead of guarding them as our own possessions. It means sharing the life we have been given instead of bottling it for our own consumption. It means giving up the notion that we can build dams to contain the bright streams of our lives and letting them go instead, letting them swell their banks and spill their wealth until they carry us down to where they run full and growing fuller into the wide and glittering sea. Following the way of Jesus may not seem so difficult if we catch this vision. We are graced to be bearers of God's hope in a time and a place that is desperately longing for hope. May we not turn back from this holy calling. Amen.
I must confess that the hymn we just sang together is one of my favorite hymns. Both the loveliness of the tune, but also the profound poetry of the text. And I think it sums up what Jesus was calling Peter and the disciples and all who would get up and follow him, calling them to do. Will you let me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. And in those simple lines is held all the ministry and mission, caring for others, the least of these, that Jesus spent his life teaching, preaching, healing into being. So I pray, as we continue this Lenten journey together, as we await the glorious dawn of yet another Easter that sends us out into God's world with joy and love and hope, may this be our mandate. As you leave worship this day, Go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, and that together we are being empowered for faithful witness and loving service each and every day of our lives. And may God's hope, peace, joy, and love flow through you and flow on to others. Amen.